not alone, church. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I am with you even into the end of the age. Isn't that good news? That's good news. You go, go ahead and turn those lights up, Sean. Appreciate that. Well, if you have your Bible today, I want you to open up to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm preparing you to move out of your comfort zone. And uh, it's very uncomfortable right now for many of us. But you know what? It's necessary in order to bring out the best in us. Your faith is not developed in a Petri dish. Your faith is developed under pressure. And sometimes we don't like the pressure in life. We don't like what we have to walk through or the different things that we experience. But I'm here to tell you today that life may not be throwing you a bunch of lemons. And if it is, then you're in the right place today. How many of you will say to me, Pastor, I'm going through something today, and I, I'm a little bit uncomfortable in where I am. Let me see your hands. All right, I've got the right crowd today. All of us love to play it safe. But if you're going to walk with God, and if you're going to walk by faith, there is a four-letter word, and it's not a dirty word, that is associated with faith that you're going to have to discover, and that is the word risk. Sometimes in following God, you're going to have to take some risk. And the reason why we don't like risk as a people, or as just humans in uh, the natural realm, is because risk enables us to really look at the downside. Most of us, when you're taking a step of faith or you're taking a risk in your life, rarely look at the upside. Most people are created as a creature of habit to look at the downside. And when you focus on the downside, what tends to happen is you tend to experience or see the downside because there will always be downsides in the midst of the upside. In other words, you can't take a step of faith and not have any downside showing in front of you ever. That's why some of us never get off of our blessed assurance in life because we're waiting for the right conditions, the right moment, the right time for us to be able to take a step and we want all the conditions in our lives to be in a perfect setting that's very contrite, very quiet, very still. But in the things of God, every step of faith is always going to be met by opposition, and it's always going to be met by opportunity. So most of us view our future outcome by our past performances. We look at what's happened in the past, and we say, well, if I take a step in this direction, uh, I know what happened last time. I know what went on in my life yesterday. And we tend to view our future outcome by our past performance, and really our past failures is what produces pain in us enough to stay in a place of what we call a comfort zone, but it's really not a comfortable place. We've just learned to be comfortable in it. And if you've come to a place in your life where you've learned to be comfortable in that place, and it's not the place that God wants you to be in, then today is the day that you shatter what is holding you back from going to the next level. See, I believe the church has been designed for advancement not for just maintaining or containing. We're meant to be advancing. And the church has never been designed for a comfortable place because when the church got comfortable in the book of Acts, you'll find out that God allowed incredible persecution to come to the church. And the reason why he allowed that persecution to come to the church was so that they could be scattered. And see, they would not go under God's direct word or God's direct voice, so God had to allow certain things to come into their lives to scatter them across the, the nations of Jerusalem and Samaria and ultimately the other parts of the earth. So we have to understand when God allows discomfort to come into our lives, a lot of times he allows it because he's trying to move you into something that's greater than you. So I believe that we're about to step into something greater. The book of Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, you don't have to turn there, but in the NIV version says this, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. You know, we live in the greatest country of the world. I'm grateful for our nation. I'm grateful that I was born here, and I get to live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. I'm grateful for our great military and our military minds. But we're living in a world today where there is uncertainty. 
There's countries that you're hearing about today, such as North Korea, that might possess weapons that could be here in 30 minutes. And that creates uncertainty in the lives of people and creates concern. And just to put our head in the sand and not address those things would be naive to do that. While we are not afraid or we're not fearful, we know just like that song we sang that our fears are going to face our God. And when God faces our fears, guess what? Fear has to crumble under the adversity of God showing up, if I could say it that way. So we have to understand we live in a time of uncertainty, and while we're complacent in this country, especially spiritually, because I'm not talking about people that go to church every week and uh, are involved in the church, because truth be told, all of America, if you interview them, everyone's a Christian mostly. But that's not true. Sunday morning sometimes can be the most segregated place in America. But I'm grateful today that we're part of a church that is multiracial, multi-ethnical, that is multicultural, and that's the way heaven looks because God creates us all individually to flow together in unity of the Spirit. So we have to move out of this place of comfort, and we're getting ready to move into an uncomfortable state. And believe me, I'm the type of person that uh, enjoys being in 34,000 square foot of space. If you were to tell me 12, uh, 14 years ago, Pastor John, you're going to occupy 34,000 square foot of space, and then in the 14th year, you're going to go into 6,000 square foot, uh, I would have said, maybe I'm not going to sign up for that deal. Because I don't like uncomfortability. I don't like closed quarters. I don't like being confined in any area. But I believe that God is saying, I'm bringing you through a narrow tunnel. I'm bringing you through a way that you never thought you'd be going, but that's not your ultimate resting place. That's not your ultimate destination. I'm bringing you through a tight place so I can bring you into a wealthy place, bring you into a large place, bring you into a place that I've prepared for you as a church. And if we just trust God and not get uncomfortable in the midst of our discomfort, everything is going to work out just fine. When was the last time you did something for the first time. Yeah. That's a question you should ask. See, most of us sit in the same seat, drive the same way to church or work. We don't take any different routes. When was the last time you got up and you said, I'm going to go a different way to, to work today because I want to see the different scenarios and the creation that God has created? When was the last time you did something for the first time? And what I'm talking about today is a lot of us like being in our area of comfort. In other words, we want to just be in that place of conformity where everything is going to go the same way tomorrow as it did today and the same way the next day as it did the day before. And I'm here to tell you, that is boring. I couldn't live that way. That's why I like the life of faith because the life of faith has uncertainties with it. And if there would not be the possibility of failure, there wouldn't be the thrill of the victory in the midst of walking with God. So I came to tell you today that we're in a season where God, not the devil, God is shifting and sifting everything out of our lives that have made us complacent. I don't know about you, but it feels like the rug is being pulled out from under my feet. But it feels so good. I can't explain why. Because I know that this is all God. This is not the enemy stealing. This is not the enemy causing regression. This is not the enemy pushing you off a place that you should have inherited. This is God doing this, and God is going to get the glory for everything he's about to do. So I came to tell you today that your comfort zone is your danger zone. It's where dreams go to die. You know, our good friend Miles Monroe is with the Lord right now. Most times when I heard him preach... He would always say that the wealthiest place in the world is not the diamond mines or the oil fields or, uh, you know, the places in Dubai that are very rich. He would say the wealthiest place that you can ever visit is your nearest cemetery. And the reason he would say that is because in the cemetery there are books that had not been written. There are businesses that were never started. There were songs that were never sung. 
There were dreams that were never realized. In other words, what he was saying was basically most of us go to our grave without fulfilling our God-given mandate and the dream and the desire that God has placed inside of us. And I'm here to tell you today, you're not too young to start and you're not too old to start. Whatever God has placed on the inside of you is a great thing that he wants to bring out of your life. And sometimes comfort can bring danger because it's where those dreams have gone to die. Many of you have had dreams, visions, desires, plans from the Lord, and you've let them die in the place of comfort, but I believe today God is going to resurrect some of them out of your life. Life does not get better by chance. Life gets better by change. And if I were to pull everybody and say, who wants change, every hand would go up. And if I said, who wants to change to see change, no hands would fly in the air. Because we all want to embrace change without changing, but the process of change is more about you than the change that you're going to experience. And I can tell you standing here today that the process that I've gone through myself has done something greater on the inside of me, far greater than the place that I could ever go to. So wherever I'm going to arrive at in God's dream or destiny for my life is going to be great because of the change that is going on inside of me. Are you hearing me, somebody? God is more concerned about what you're becoming rather than where you're going. Where you're going isn't the important part because you could be going to a land that's flowing with milk and honey, but if you're not changed on the inside, guess what? You'll still be miserable. You'll still be dissatisfied. You'll still be grumbling and complaining. But if you could ever get the heart of God and understand God wants to change you from the inside out, life gets better with change. Say change. The shell has to break before the bird can fly. The bird wants to just stay in that shell because mama's sitting on the egg. It's perfect temperature. All my nutrients are inside. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to labor to get anything. I could just stay in this shell forever. But eventually, the bird has to outgrow the shell. And many of you are about to break your shell today. You're about to find out that you were born not to walk, you were born to soar. That you were born to fly, that God has placed greatness on the inside of you and he has a great destiny inside for you. And sometimes the problem with most of us is that we're too busy comparing our destiny and our calling with someone else's. And see, the moment that you compare yourself to someone else, that's where you get in trouble because God is not comparing you to someone else. Stop saying, I wish I could do what he's doing or I wish I could be what she is. And comparing yourself to all of these people that you have an image of your mind that God only looks at people that are ultra successful in a certain area and because you have not arrived at that place yet, you're a failure. That's the farthest thing from the truth. In the mind of God, God only wants you to compare what he's planned for you and whatever his desire is for your life. So stop comparing yourself with other people because when you do that, you belittle yourself and you make other people greater in the sight of you and them and in the sight of God, and it's not true. So life begins at the end of my comfort zone. It begins at the end. And if you're at the end of your comfort zone, if you feel a little bit uncomfortable today, I believe life is about to begin for you in a greater dimension and a greater capacity. I came to tell you today, don't judge my future destination by my present location. See, I see something greater. You say, Pastor, what is your vision? What is your dream? My dream is to touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. My dream is to encourage people and their gifting and the, the call of God upon their lives so that it comes and fully develops. I get more joy in seeing people soar in the things of God. It brings me such pleasure seeing you accomplish great things and doing great things in your business and in your career and in your families and all the things that you do. That's what I live for every day, to see you excel more and more because it makes me feel like a proud papa sometimes. So life begins at the end of your comfort zone and you can't judge your future destination by where you are presently. And most of us do. Most of us are saying just like, uh, you, you know, the, the old movie that said, there's got to be more than this. Is this all there is? So I want you to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse number 7. It says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. In order to leave your comfort zone, 
you have to be willing to walk by what you don't see, but what you do see. Now, that may sound totally contradictory, but that is a powerful truth. In other words, I've been living my life walking by what I don't see out of these natural eyes, but what I do see in these spiritual eyes. And see, you have to learn how to govern your life to walk by faith and not by sight. You have to learn how to walk by faith and not by feelings. You have to walk by faith and not what people say about you. You have to begin to walk by faith and not what you even think about yourself. And see, if failure wasn't a possibility, then there would not be any real joy in the victory. So walking by faith ha has a connotation of a possibility that you could fail. Now, I know a lot of you won't admit that, but when you take a step of faith, it doesn't look like that something is going to happen on the onset. A lot of times you step out in faith and you see absolutely nothing. Sometimes you step out in faith and you see worse than if you would have stepped out of faith. Sometimes you say, I wish I didn't even step out in faith because it got worse after I stepped out of fa in faith. So we have to understand we walk by faith and not by sight. And if we're going to leave our comfort zone, we have to learn how to walk against the grain of this flesh, against the desires to be comforted and pampered and taken care of and begin to walk after what God desires for our lives. Now I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I want to just talk to you for a few moments about Abraham. Hebrews 11, verse number 8. Abraham, as we know, was in the land of the Chaldeans or the Ur of Chaldees, and that's where he was living with his father, his family. And imagine God showing up to you uh, in a vision or in a dream or in an audible voice. I don't know how he showed up to him in that moment. But he appeared to him and he spoke to him and he said, Abraham, I want you to leave everything that you know that you've relied on, your family. I want you to leave this region. I want you to leave and I want you to follow my voice. And if you'll follow me, I'll take you to a land uh, that will be incredible. I'll bless you and in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed and I'll bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And God gives him this incredible promise. And I want you to see this in Hebrews chapter 11 in verse number 8. It says, by faith. In other words, Abraham didn't feel like going. It wasn't a feeling that propelled him. See, if you're waiting for a feeling to step out of your comfort zone, it's never going to come. Because you know what? In your comfort zone, you want to feel comfortable. You want to stay there. You want to stay in that place. And see, by faith, Abraham obeyed. Say obeyed. See, the word obey is something that some of us have taken out of the New Testament context uh, because we understand we're in the age of grace, and that's true. And in the Old Testament, I had to do something in order for God to respond to me. In other words, if I follow and obey his commandments, then he would bless me. And in the New Testament, God blesses me under grace, and then I'm supposed to respond and obey him because he's already blessed me. So the obedience was never removed from the equation. So we have to understand Abraham obeyed, and he obeyed the command of God, and by faith he obeyed, and when he was called to go out to a place where he would receive as an inheritance, he went out not knowing where he was going. Isn't that interesting about God, that when God calls you to do something, you're not going to have all the minute details in order to know what to do? Isn't it interesting that when God calls you out, into some area or some arena that you might not have all the answers or you might not have all the ways of doing things according to what the world standards are. And he calls him out into a place and he obeyed and he calls him out into a place, it says here, by faith as he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country. In other words, when you step out of the boat or out of your comfort, it's going to feel foreign to you. It's going to feel like you're in an uncomfortable place, in a foreign country. You're in a place where you don't think you should really be. It's uncomfortable, and sometimes when we take that step and it feels uncomfortable, what's the first thing we do? We go back to what we know. We go back to our comfort place. We go back to our happy place. We go back to staying in that place. And see, he had to obey God even when it didn't look right, even when it didn't sound right, even when it didn't feel right. He still had to obey. And by faith, he dwelt in that land of promise as a foreign country, 
dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker was God. So he's out in this foreign country and he's looking for a city. He's looking for something that God was leading him to. God never told him where he was taking him. He just said, come with me. God sometimes will not tell you what's going to happen. He's just going to tell you to go. And if you wait to get the answer from God to what is going to happen or what's going to take place in that place, you're never going to go and you're going to grow old and you're never going to fulfill your God-given mandate. So he looked and he waited for a city whose builder and maker was God. What promise did God give you that you have stopped looking for? Maybe you stopped looking because when you started looking for that place, you experienced incredible discomfort. See, between the promise and the provision, there's always discomfort. Between the promise and the answer, there's always problems. Between the promise and the answer, there's always a faith fight that you have to continually believe God for. Because if you're going to see dreams fulfilled and visions realized in your life, you're going to have to fight for it by faith. You're going to have to be aggressive, and you're going to have to have to lay hold to everything that God has already said. See, on every new level, you're tempted to return to the previous place of comfort. Look back at Hebrews 10, just a chapter back in verse 35. It says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance. Say endurance. See, the older you get, the less endurance you have. Ask me how I know. It's hard to push and train and do certain things. And uh, the body just, the, you know, it's like, I, I know what that scripture means. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, the spirit wants to do certain things, but sometimes, you know, uh, I don't know who I was telling, but uh, I was telling some people that, you know, basically uh, New Year's Eve used to be a great time for us. And I would go out basically at 10, 11 o'clock to have dinner, and I'd stay up till 1, 2 in the morning. And I was just thinking the other day, when was the last time you were even up to see the ball drop? And I had to think back to many, many years ago because by 11 o'clock, these eyelids start to feel very heavy. They feel very weighed down, and all of a sudden, I, I can turn in at 11 o'clock and don't even care about that ball dropping when it was one of the most exciting things in my life that I looked forward to. So when you get a little bit older, your endurance for certain things that was so easy early on in life just seems to go away. Now, I know if you're a young person in this room today, you may not be able to relate to that, but just wait. Give it some time, and you'll know. You'll be able to say many years from now, now I know what Pastor John was talking about when he said the eyelids were heavy. So we have to have endurance so that after we've done the will of God, we can receive the promise. We have to still do the will of God in order to receive the promise. And he goes on to say in verse 38, the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In other words, God wants us to step out of comfort and never to draw back into a place of comfort. Now, does that mean you don't relax or have vacationing or do things? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what is it that God has called you as an individual that makes up this body to do spiritually that maybe you've been comfortable in an area and you're not ministering or serving in that area. See, because we need every gift and talent in the body of Christ. We need every singer that can sing. You know, I, I, I hate when people are in the church and then all of a sudden you turn on the TV and you see them singing on the voice. And you never knew they could sing in the church. We need every singer. We need every musician. We need every people laboring in different areas of ministry. Why? Because you have a call of God upon your life to minister to the body of Christ so that the body can grow up into the fullness of what God desires for us. So it's not just the chosen few. We're all chosen. And we all have to understand that, that if we're going to do that, we have to get out of our comfort zone and not just view church as a place that I come to to sing songs, sit in a chair, hear some good messages, and go home and repeat it week after week. That I am called the body of Christ and that I'm called as a minister just as I'm a minister to go out and minister to hurting people and bring the gospel of grace across this land and minister healing and deliverance to those that you come 
come in contact with. The church is not just a place to gather to make you feel good. You shouldn't come to church to feel good. I see how silent I got there. Well, I'm looking for a church that makes me feel good. Honey, if you feel good in church all the time, you're not hearing from God because God should make you a little uncomfortable so that she causes you to rise up and do something with the gifting that he's placed on the inside of you. Instead of just sitting on your gift, you have gifts to use out in the culture, out in the marketplace, and you should be using them to glorify God. So I want you to turn back to Luke chapter 5. Here's really where I want to spend my time. Luke chapter 5. Oh, this is an incredible story, and we all know this story, but I'm not teaching you something that you don't know today. We don't suffer from what we don't know, church. We suffer from what we know, and we're not doing. We don't need a new revelation. We've got enough revelation to change the world right now. In the book of Luke, it's interesting because when you read about Peter, and you're going to see, and we all know this, that Peter was an incredible, sinful man. And Jesus never, ever considered Peter's past failures to determine his future direction. And you need to understand that if, G if Jesus considered my past failures, I wouldn't be standing here before you today because I'd be out on the street somewhere. If Jesus was looking for qualified people, uh, none of us would be here. Whoever God calls, God qualifies. And you may not be qualified today, but you're in the right place because God can qualify you, and he can make you a trophy of his grace. Jesus never considered Peter's past failure to determine what he was going to do with him because in the mind of God, Peter was always going to be an apostle. And see, he was comfortable in his fishing business. He was probably doing very well. And just to note, some of you that are called to full-time ministry, uh, it's interesting that many times God won't call you until you're doing very well out in society, where you'll have to make a choice to leave something good for something that may not look as good on the onset. And I can tell you from experience that if you follow that voice and you choose that voice, that you'll live your dream and you'll live your passion. And it won't be about success in the world's standards. It'll be about success in God's standards by the kingdom of God. So he doesn't consult my past to determine my future, which means I don't care about your past. God doesn't care about your past. Your past is past. What can you do today to change your past? Nothing. You can't go back and fix a broken marriage that ended in divorce. You can't fix a, a, a house that was lost. You can't go back in the past and fix a failure that you made, something you did that was not good. You know what? It's over. Bury it. Finish it and move on so that you can live in the present and so that you can move in the here and now. So he was with the multitude that were pressing around Jesus, and they came by to hear the word of God, and he stood by this lake of Genesaret. And it's interesting to me that Jesus didn't have a wireless, headless microphone that was connected to incredible speaker system. It's amazing how he spoke to literally five and 10,000 people at a time. And he wanted to push off the boat into the waters because it would make like sort of an echo. That's probably how they heard him. It sort of magnified his voice from the boat and the water coming forth to where he was. And they pushed off uh, because he saw two boats uh, on the lake. And they were out, the men that had the boats were out cleaning their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's in verse 3. And he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. Now, he probably was doing this in the morning. If they were washing their nets, it was probably, uh, you normally go out fishing to catch fish early in the morning, 3, 4 in the morning, and you probably come back, you know, before lunchtime. So this must have been probably after lunch, could be, could have been a little earlier, could have been a little later. And uh, Jesus spoke to Simon, and he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, when Simon heard that, he probably had to say to myself, he probably said to himself, I've been fishing all my life. I'm a professional fisherman. You've been preaching probably for a couple of days, a week, a couple of months right now. What do you know about fishing? And you're telling me to go down and let down my nets for a catch in the wrong time at the wrong place. Because if you know anything about catching fish, a lot of times you don't go out into the deep, especially in the lakes that they were. They were in a lake. They weren't in the ocean. In the ocean, you would go out deep. In the lakes, you would go out across into the sides where the, the uh, you know, 
grass was growing and all the different vegetation was growing where the fish would sort of troll in between there and they would drag their nets along the seashore all the way around the perimeter of the lake. So to go out into the midst of the deep, well, not only was it the wrong place, it was also the wrong time. And he's hearing that, and probably he had a, to wrestle with himself for a few moments because God was asking him to do something that I believe God is asking many of you to do today. And that is to launch out into the deep. The deep represents out of your comfort zone, out of a place where you're comfortable or the known place of where you always did it the way that you wanted to do it. See, if it was up to me, I would do it the way I always want to do it the way I'm comfortable with it, the way I'm used to it. But sometimes God is saying, you know what? We're tired of the way that you're doing it, and we want to take it out into the deep, into a place outside of your comfort zone. So into the deep means outside of your comfort zone. It's a place where you have never been before. Do you know that we're about to embark upon a place that we've never been to before? We're about to step into a season that we've never gone this way before, but you know what? It's so exciting. It's so invigorating because I have expectation every day. I'm looking for that city whose builder and maker is God. When you're walking by faith and not by sight, you're excited because you're looking for something that you have not seen yet. And when it shows up, you're going to be even more excited than you were in the journey or in the process. So it's a place you've never been to before. You're longing for comfort, but God's miracles are never experienced on the shore of comfortability. If you want a miracle, you got to get outside the shore of comfortability. you got to get outside of the known. You know, that's how Jesus operated upon this earth all the time. In other words, a lot of us want to just do it the same old way. Well, we lay hands on the sick and they recover. Well, Jesus sometimes spit on the ground and made mud and put it on a man's eyes, and that's how the blind man saw. That was out of his comfort zone, I can tell you. If God told me to do that, it would be out of my comfort zone. When I say, uh, you're blind, just wait here. I've got to go spit and make some mud out in the dirt, and then I'm going to put it on your eyes, and you're going to get healed. That's outside of our comfort zone to do that. Why does God do that? Because God doesn't want you getting caught up in a method or in a system. He wants you getting caught up with him and understanding that he is the healer. He is the deliverer. He is the savior. He is the provider. He's the one that does everything that we need to do. And when we can trust him and not the system or the formula, then we get out of our comfort zone. See, we want systems and structures, and we need them in all types of life to create order. But order is not comfort. And see, sometimes we can get comfortable in our orderliness instead of just flowing with what God wants to do. So it's a place where you're going to experience miracles outside of your comfort zone, outside of the known place. And the old adage says, if you want something you've never had, you got to do something you've never done. We quote that over and over again, but you know what we do? We quote that, but we never do that. We always say, well, if you want something you never had, you got to do something you never did. And then we never do the thing that we never did. And that's why we never experience the thing that we've never done. Repeat that back to me, will you please? <laughs> He says, launch out into the deep. A preacher, man, never fished before. Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. We've toiled all night. I wonder if I'm talking to any people, you've toiled, not all night, but you've toiled for years. You've toiled. You've constantly been in a place where now you feel fatigued. You've been under hard labor. You've become weary. And that's why the Bible says in Galatians 6, 9, that we should not grow weary in well-doing, but we shall reap in due season if we what? Faint not. So the key is not to faint. doesn't mean you're not going to grow weary. doesn't mean you're not going to get tired. doesn't mean you're not going to get fatigued in life. But don't grow weary. Don't faint because guess what? You are going to reap in due season. There is a due season coming. So he said, we toiled all this night. We've caught nothing. But notice what he says to him. He says, nevertheless... At your word, I will let down the net. Here's the key that you need to get if you want to experience a manifestation in your life. When you do, your willingness to obey God's word is what will determine what you experience. This is going to sound so simple, but it's so true. 
What if Peter didn't let down the net? There would be no fish. And see, to let down the net is something that goes against our comfort zone because you know what? That means more work. We don't want more work. See, if I was Peter, I would have said, Master, I've been toiling all night. Let me go home to my nice pillow top, king size bed. Let me sleep for eight hours, get rejuvenated, get rested, get refreshed, and I'll come out here tomorrow morning and I'll let down the net. But see, when the word of the Lord comes to you, you cannot procrastinate around that word and you can't dance around it. When that word comes, you've got to act on that word. That's why when you get a word from God, if you act on it immediately, you're going to see the manifestation of it. And see, we're all guilty, and I'm included, so I'll confess because confession is good for the soul. Uh, when I get a word from God, a lot of times I want to pray over it. I want to see what other people think about it. I want to get a few confirmations over it. I want to make sure, is this really God? But when you know it's God, you need to act on it right away. Why do we procrastinate and not move upon God's word a lot of times? Because we like staying in our comfort zone. If God gave you 100% more of what you have on a daily basis, you may not want it because even though it's going to bring increase and abundance into your life, you may not want the extra work that goes along with it. As long as there's no ox in the stall, the stall is clean, the Bible says. If you don't want any poo-poo around, don't bring any oxen into your stall. But if you want a lot of people around, you want a lot of growth going on, you want a lot of influence happening, you're going to have a whole bunch of mess to clean up every day. And a lot of us don't want to get out the broom and, and the pan and sweep up all the mess that people leave every day. We complain about the mess, but we never rejoice over the increase and the blessing that God gives to us. Why is that? So we taught all night. But nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to let down your net. Now, we can go into what it makes for great preaching, net versus Jesus saying nets. I know Jesus wanted them to dump all the nets. If they would have dumped all the nets, guess what? The, the catch of fish would have been even more miraculous than what took place here. Nevertheless, I'd let down the net. And when they had done this, say done this, you have to do something. You can't just sit back and say, Lord, when are you going to show up? You know where I live, Lord. You know where I sit. I'm here every week. You know, people used to say that all the time. I'm here every If God wanted to touch me, he'd just show up and touch No, you've got to make a demand upon something. You've got to do something with your faith. Your faith is not just sitting back comfortable. Your faith is in action, doing something, progressing towards something. And when they had done this, when they had done what? They let down the net. They caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. They were catching so many fish that the net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. In other words, when God begins bringing you out of your comfort zone and he brings you into a place in the deep where he's going to bring abundance into your life, it's not going to be just for you. It's going to be for you and for a whole bunch of people around you. In other words, the blessing is not just to make me feel better or make me fat or make me have more. The blessing on my life is so that it runs off of me onto your life. And when we all have that blessing flowing out of our lives onto the lives of others, guess what? People are attracted to who? To him. They point to Jesus and they say, Jesus did this. Jesus caused us to catch a great multitude of fish. Jesus is the one that brought this miracle to pass. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. I happened to be on a boat yesterday with probably 12 people. And I'll tell you, that boat didn't move one iota in that water. How many fish do you think would they have to catch in order to sink a boat? I've never seen a boat sinking that was catching fish. And I've seen some large fish come into the boat. The boats were sinking because of the haul of fish that were coming in. I'm telling you today, and I'm prophesying over you as a church today, and all of you that are watching my live stream today, if you'll get out of your comfort zone, if you'll begin to move out of that place that makes you comfortable and out into the deep areas where God is calling to you to, God is about to sink many of your boats, and you're about to step into something so incredible, so prophetic, so pre-planned by the hand of God that you'll be pinching yourself saying, uh, is this a dream that this is happening to me? Yeah, you get ready for it. Some of you will grab a hold of that. That word is burning inside of me. Some of you heard that word and said, well, I don't know if I believe that. I've stepped out before. 
I didn't see anything. So that's what I'm talking about. The, the walk of faith, the life of faith said, yes, I'm expecting God to do great and mighty things today. I'm expecting God to break through in this area of my life today. I'm expecting that if I obey his voice today, that I'm going to have a net-breaking experience in my personal life, and God is going to begin to do great and mighty things in my midst. Look what he says in verse 8. Peter saw it. He falls down on his knees, and he says, Depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. And all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John and all these different people were with him. And he said, don't be afraid. From now on, you shall catch men. The whole purpose, you better hear me now because I, I, you know, I believe in prosperity. I teach prosperity, but I don't teach prosperity just for you to get fat and comfortable. The whole purpose of the blessing in our lives is so that we'll be, have abundance to free us up to catch more men. It's not about living a more comfortable life. Whoever told you that told you wrong because the blessing of God, the purpose is so that I can have more resources, more time, more ability to go out and become a fisher of men. And see, the church has gotten fat on great worship, on great teaching, on great things that are, uh, you know, coming come to the church of America, and we like it and we're comfortable with it. And we can go to church for an hour once a week or twice a month, and we're just comfortable with that level of progress in our lives spiritually, but God is saying that day is coming to an end. I'm about to revolutionize my church, and I'm about to cause a divine eruption of people that aren't in it for themselves just to build a kingdom upon this earth. They're in it because they want to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They want souls coming into the kingdom. They want people that are lost to be found. And honey, we can't do it without resources. We can't do it without buildings. We can't do it without people that are committed to the vision that God is given us. And guess what? Am I excited and loud? You better believe I am. Part of it because I'm Italian. I, I need some people working on these cameras so I can get out and move around here. You got me chained down to one spot so people can see me. No, honey, I'm going to hire somebody pretty soon if I don't get any volunteers. I'm just playing. Now, pastor's not getting nasty. <laughs> just I feel like a caged lion behind this, this sacred desk, <laughs> as they used to call it. So we have to understand. Let me close with this. This will be my first closing. And I do have a wedding to do after this. Bruce and Catherine are getting married today right after this service. God bless them. So good to see my golf buddy here, Gary, and his lovely wife here today, Mary. I call you Mary. When I call, when I see a Mary, I call Meredith. I don't know why I call Mary Meredith. <laughs> but our purpose is this. Let's be serious about the things of God. Let's move out of our comfort zone and realize, you know what? I've only got so many years left. And I'm telling you, I think Jesus is coming back real soon. I think that we could be the generation that sees his return. And you know what? What good is just piling up stuff when he's coming back? I want him to come back seeing me busy catching fish. I don't want him seeing me busy living off the fish that I caught and just enjoying the blessing of God. Yes, now I'm not saying you can't enjoy life and have a vacation. That's not what Pastor John's saying. Oh, I went to church Sunday and Pastor said I got work, 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 work. No, the grace of God frees you from works, but yet we work because we're empowered by God to do the work so it doesn't feel like work. It feels like you're having the time of your life. So it's not work that you're doing. You're fulfilling your God-given mandate. And if we all do that, guess what? There's great joy in fulfilling what God has placed in our hearts to do. And together, co as a cooperation, we come together to touch the world or touch this portion of the earth as one of many great churches that are down here that are called to impact and change people's lives. So the, the, the whole message is that we're being touched and we're going to be blessed for this purpose so that we can become fishers of men. Let's start catching men and women in this community. When was the last time you invited someone to make Jesus the Lord of their life? When was the last time you told somebody that you love Jesus? When was the last time you shared your testimony with someone? When was the last time you brought or invited someone to church? I'm just talking to you about being proactive on becoming 
a fisher of men because Jesus will teach you how to do it. Bow your heads with me. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you that you've called us for such a time as this, not just to occupy chairs and not just to be a part of a church service, but you've called us to be the church, to be Jesus with skin on, where we would touch people just as you walked this earth and touched them when you were here. We're here to bring words of comfort and kindness and affirmation and blessing and healing into people's lives. And I pray that your people would take this word today and not look at it from a selfish point of view for what they could get from you, but look at it as how they can give what they get from you to others. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, with every head bowed and every eye closed, no one moving around, maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching by our live stream or a rebroadcast, and you've never made Jesus Christ your Savior and your Lord. I'm here to tell you boldly and plainly that without Jesus, you're lost. There's nothing that you can do in yourself that can obtain eternal life. You can't work for it. You can't give enough. You can't even be good enough because it's not based upon your condition or based upon your attitude or your actions. It's based upon who shed their blood in order to redeem you. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ came to earth as a man. And he laid his life down and gave his life as a sacrifice and as an offering. So that all you have to do is believe on him. And as you believe on him, you have everlasting life. So today, if you want to do that in this room or you want to do that watching, I want you to just pray this prayer after me. Just say it out of your mouth and believe it in your heart. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, today, in the presence of God, I change my mind with the purpose of changing my direction. I invite you, Jesus Christ, to come into my life and to save me. I turn my back on my past to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you just prayed that prayer in this room today or watching my live stream, I want to welcome you to the family of God. We have a little booklet that we'd like to give you to get you started right in your journey with Jesus Christ. If you'll just go to our website, thefaithcenter.com, and click on the information page, send me your name, your address, and I'll send you that book free and posted paid. We appreciate you watching and tuning in each week. Watch again next week. We love you, and we'll see you soon. God bless you. I wonder if there's anyone in this room today that may have prayed that prayer for the first time. You say, Pastor, I never made Jesus the Lord of my life, but I know today. I know because of my decision, I'm saved and I'm in the family of God. If that's you, just slip your hand up. We have a little book or a, and a Bible that we want to give you to get you started right in the things of God. Why don't we all stand to our feet? I bless you today. I thank you for coming today. You could have been anywhere today, on the beach, on the golf course, boating, whatever. But you came today to meet God, and I pray that God met you. Our altar is always open here. We have people that are ministers that will pray for you, speak the word of God over you. If you need prayer for any reason, healing, if you need us to agree and a touch for, for a situation you might be going through, please come forward before you leave today and let, of our, let one of our altar workers minister to you today. Amen? Well, Father, I bless your people today. I thank you that your face shines upon them, that your grace and your goodness and your mercy is with them all the days of their life. Until we meet again, let this week be the best week they ever experienced in you. And let your presence infiltrate every area of their life and allow your Holy Spirit to bring us out of our comfort zone into the place where you've called us to be, out in the deep. In Jesus' name.